Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio. I'm back in the States and Jacob's in England. And Jacob, one of the believers, had this question. He wanted to understand the role of the Holy Spirit in both the Old and the New Covenants. Okay. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant was only for certain people at certain times under certain circumstances. It's Specifically, patriarchs, high priests, kings, prophets, and judges. Patriarchs, judges, or the Shoftim, okay, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so forth, okay, um, then kings, then high priests, and prophets. It was only for certain people at certain times under certain circumstances. Under the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit indwells all who believe. Now, as for the distinction between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, after Jesus died for our sin and rose from the dead, in John chapter 20, verse 22, he breathes on the apostles, the word their pneuma, and says, receive the Holy Spirit. At that point, the apostles were regenerate. They were born again, as it were, born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwelt them. That's when they were born again. Jesus had died and risen. It was possible for them to have second birth. But then, as we read in Luke particularly, he told them to go wait for the Holy Spirit. That was the whole outpouring. Now, this is a massive subject, too long to answer in a short film clip on Morial TV, it would require a whole, whole Bible study. That's why we have a Bible study devoted to it. I would urge you to go to the Morial website or to do a Google search and, and find our teaching on baptism, Jacob Prash and baptism. We explain the difference between the indwelling of the Spirit and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We examine the different terms baptism of the holy spirit promise of the holy spirit gift of the holy spirit receiving of the holy spirit watch that teaching it explains the entire baptism concept from the old testament as well as the new remember in first corinthians chapter 10 paul gives us the perfect illustration or picture of baptism from the old testament Testament. Our fathers were baptized in the sea and in the cloud. Actually, it says the cloud, the Shekinah, and the sea. Spirit baptism and water baptism. That is the basis of the New Testament for the distinction between the two. It, it's John 20, it's 1 Corinthians 10, it's Acts chapter 1. It's go to Jerusalem, you shall receive the Holy Spirit. All include in the teaching. But thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thanks. Thank you, Jacob. Good to be with you here this morning. In fact, it'd be good to be anywhere. I feel like I fell out of a hearse. <laughs> Between lymphatic edema and my neck injury, which has caused paralysis of my 
left hand since since Thursday. The reason I'm not wearing a tie is I only I couldn't figure out how to tie it with one hand. <laughs> Your prayers are appreciated. I've got to see if I can get some Voltarol tomorrow. Hope it works. In any event, here we are. The Lord is good. I've been asked to speak about the baptism of the Spirit today. Not a subject I usually speak about, but I'm happy to do it if I'm asked to. Uh, you know, that hymn we were singing is one of my favorite. Well, we sang a, a number of wonderful hymns today. But the one, Christ Returneth, Hallelujah. I love that thing. You know, when I just pick up a newspaper and I see that they're teaching kids same-sex marriage to little kids, and there's no stopping this stuff. I just, come Lord Jesus, you know. I don't know any, I don't know any other way to stop it. How long? Well, that's a good, how, how much longer can it go on like this? You know, I, I love my grandson, but what's he growing up in? I mean, it's just diabolical how long he's coming, but he's placed us here at this time to prepare the way for his coming. That's what we have to focus on. The baptism of the Spirit. You know, ours is not a God of confusion. And I've seen so much confusion concerning this particular subject. I've been to meetings, and you have too, where they talked about this. And then they told people, if you've never been baptized in the Spirit, come up and we're going to lay hands on you. And there's actually places in America you see this. Just say whatever comes into your head and move your lips like this. <laughs> Trying to get people to speak in tongues and because they believe that's initial evidence or something like that. I've seen so many people. Then there's the arguments between the oncers and the twicers. No, you, it happens when you're born again. No, there's a second experience in grace. You know, there's a second. The arguments between the oncers and the twicers. That's another big one. Then there's the cessationists who have the erroneous belief that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles, but then you have the hyper-charismatics and ultra-Pentecostals who swing on the chandeliers on the other extreme. You've got the lunatic fringe on one, and then you've got the cessationists on the... So much confusion. But you know, the confusion, most of it is not necessary. It's like anything else. If we have a foundational understanding of the fundamentals, you can accommodate the rest. Once you have a foundational understanding of the fundamentals, you can accommodate the rest. Part of the problem we have is the early Pentecostals, the Azusa Street and what happened here in, with the days of Smith Wigglesworth and people like this. Most of the early Pentecostals were not educated people. They were not educated, most of them were not. Now, being unlearned does not mean somebody is ignorant. Being unlearned does not mean somebody is ignorant. Matthew, uh, John, James, Peter, they were, at least by the standards of the Jewish world, unlearned. Now, by the standards of the, the Gentile world, they were reasonably well educated in the sense they were at least literate. In the Jewish world, in the ancient world, every Jew had to be able to read the Torah. Every Jew had to be numerate and literate. The Levites had to make sure that every Jew could read the Word of God. In the pagan world, this was not so. In the pagan world, literacy was the domain of the nobility, royalty, aristocracy, military commanders, pagan priesthoods, people like this. The Jews, everybody had to be literate. So when it says the apostles were unlearned men, well, they were unlearned by Jewish standards. They were not unlearned by the general standards of the Greco-Roman world, okay? Nonetheless, they were unlearned, but that did not mean they were ignorant. Now, the second generation of leaders, you see, the second generation of leaders who God raised up, Barnabas, Paul, um, certainly Apollos, Luke, the second generation were more educated than the first, weren't they? And Peter acknowledges this in his epistle. He says, let our brother Paul explain the complicated things that the unlearned will distort. You know, A gross example of unlearned people 
mishandling the scriptures as the Jehovah's Witnesses. That, that's a gross example. Most religions, even most false religions, want some kind of academic credibility. So they have educated people. Even the Mormons have Brigham Young University. Or the Catholics have Georgetown University in the States or Notre Dame University. Or the Jews have Jews College Oxford or Yeshiva University. They, they, they all want some kind of credibility. Jehovah's Witnesses downplay education. They're basically kept unlearned. They're kept unlearned. And Acts 4.13 when the Sanhedrin saw the apostles and perceived that they were uneducated men, they were confounded by their wisdom because they'd been with Jesus. Remember, if people have been with Jesus, they don't stay simple, even if they're not formally educated. And remember, the second generation of leaders who the Lord raised up were educated. Even the pagan governments, the, the, the Roman governors recognized Paul. They said to him in Caesarea, your great learning has driven you mad. They, they, they knew that these were learned men. Uh, we have the Bible. William Tyndale was an educated man. You know, we have the reformers were educated men for all of their faults. Jesus made it clear, I will send you scribes. People say, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Yeah, but he also said, I will send you scribes. I'll send you experts in the text. I will send you theologians. He said when a scribe, a sofer would be the Hebrew term, becomes a disciple, he'll bring out of the treasury things old and things new. People who know the original languages are going to see things other people don't, you know. <laughs> Again, it always comes down to this. And I've explained this before. When you see people elevating education, and looking down upon people who are not educated, that is spiritual pride based on superiority. On the other hand, when you see people demeaning education, the apostles didn't go to Bible college, <laughs> that's spiritual pride based on inferiority. Both are wrong. Both are co-equally carnal. Neither is scriptural. Peter made this quite clear in his epistle. Paul has the wisdom to explain these complicated things. Untaught people are going to distort them, to the, even to their own destruction. Again, the most extreme example we'd be familiar with would be the Jehovah's Witnesses. With early Pentecostalism, you had simple people. They were mainly working class people. But eventually, some people came along and put grain into the toxic stew. In other words, they used right doctrine and right teaching to correct the errors of, of mainstream Pentecostalism, and it became okay. It became okay. Okay. Uh, but then, in the 1940s and 50s, they rejected things, like William Branham, and, and, and they rejected E.W. Kenyon, all this kind of stuff. What, what, what the Assemblies of God and Elam and things, the things that they rejected in the 1940s and 50s, have today become <laughs> mainstream Pentecostalism, the things they used to reject. Charismatics are an even more sad story. I had a friend who's an Anglican theologian who was one of my professors, and his father is a famous Anglican theologian, evangelical Anglican, he's saved. And, but he's not in my camp theologically, obviously, but he was a believer, and he's a friend of mine, and he's a good, good scholar. And so I asked him, Steve, how is it that Anglican clergy will follow the Kansas City prophets. An alcoholic and a homosexual like Paul Cain gives them a prophecy, and that's the word of God to them. Why will they follow these crazy people? And he said to me, Anglican seminaries for decades have not been teaching the word of God as doctrine. They've only been teaching it as history and literature. <laughs> So when they get baptized in the spirit or they get saved or whatever happens to them and somebody comes along and gives them a prophecy, that becomes the word of God to them. They never learned this as doctrine. So even education doesn't guarantee anything, it doesn't. You've got educated people who can be just as crazy as uneducated people. You've got people who have formal educations in theology who can be just as wacky as the other ones. Nonetheless, we have to learn what the scriptures actually say. 
anybody can understand these basic principles. All of this confusion and experiential theology and lunacy we've seen, most of it is not necessary. And most of the differences among believers concerning this issue of spirit baptism is really unnecessary when we understand the basic mechanics. Let's begin by understanding what baptism is and what it does. Turn with me, please, to one of the most important chapters in the New Testament, I'm convinced. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and it's important for a number of reasons. Now understand this. In the Old Testament, okay, before the death and resurrection of Jesus, before the day of Pentecost, back into the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was only for certain people at certain times. Patriarchs, judges, high priests, kings, and prophets. Only certain people had the Holy Spirit at certain times. It's not like now under the Old Covenant. Let's look now, 1 Corinthians 10. I do not want you, in verse 1, to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and passed through the sea. They were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The cloud is the Shekinah, spirit baptism. They were baptized in the, Sh the Shekinah and the sea, water baptism. You go into the water, you're co-dead with Christ, you come out resurrected. Notice it's the cloud and the sea. They were all, and it puts the cloud first. Interesting. It puts the cloud before the sea, puts the spirit before, puts the Shekinah before the water, in, at least in the order of the text. What baptism is and what baptism does is quite simple. Now, the Jews had baptism rituals called mikvah bris. John the Baptist was practicing a baptism of repentance. The Essenes had repeated baptisms. The pagans, even some of the pagan Greeks, had baptismal rituals. Okay. They looked upon it, however, as a washing. A washing. In the New Covenant, it's a burial. The focus is on a burial. The way you get rid of the sin is you get rid of the sinner. <laughs> if somebody suffers from polio and they die, they don't have polio anymore. <laughs> That's how it is. They all had baptism, but they thought of it as a cleansing, as a catharsis. Catharsis. The Greek, we get the word catharsis from the Greek. That's how they thought of it. Scripturally, it was something else. Death and resurrection. Okay. The water and the cloud, the cloud and the sea. What baptism does, and all it does, is it takes an objective truth and makes it a subjective experience. It takes something which is positionally true and makes it experientially true. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20. Verse 22, now he has died for their sin and our sin and rose from the dead. He's conquered death, okay, but Pentecost has not happened yet. It's that gap period. And he states the following. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. It was at that point the apostles were regenerate. It was at that point they were born again. But then why does he go and tell them to wait for the Holy Spirit? 
Why does he tell them to go wait for that which they have already received? This begins the confusion. There are two ways this can be explained at least. The first is from Romans chapter 6. We are baptized into his death. If somebody gives up the ghost, they go to be with the Lord, but they have not been, the corpse has not been buried yet. You can embalm the corpse. Subjectively, experientially, they are still with us. It looks like they're asleep. Subjectively, they're with us. Objectively, they've entered eternity. Subjectively, they're still with us. But when you go down to the graveyard and you inter the corpse, the objective reality becomes a subjective one. That which is positionally true, they've entered eternally, eternity, now becomes experientially true. Baptism takes the objective and makes it subjective. It takes the positional and makes it experiential. When somebody is born again, they get the spirit. That's an objective truth. But the subjective experience is something different. Let's consider holy matrimony. Jack and Jill meet in church. Jack and Jill are attracted. Jack and Jill fall in love. Jack and Jill get engaged. Jack and Jill get married. The preacher says, I now pronounce you man and wife. In the eyes of God, they are one because they have made a vow most importantly. In the eyes of the church, they are one because they have made the vow in the presence of the witnesses. In the eyes of the law, they are one civilly because they've made a contract. And not least of all, because they've exchanged these vows, they are one in the eyes of each other. I now pronounce you man and wife, you may kiss the bride, Jack and Jill, there they go down the aisle on the honeymoon. When they walk out of that church, objectively, they are one. When they consummate the marriage, the objective oneness becomes a subjective oneness. That which is positionally true now becomes experientially true. It's not to say they weren't one before they consummated the marriage. But consummation makes the objective truth a subjective experience. Burying the corpse makes the objective truth a subjective reality. We are tangible, physical beings. Now this gets a bit complicated theologically and philosophically. I don't want to bore you with it, but the Greeks were dualists. They had these ethereal, everything spiritual was good, everything physical was bad. No, no, the word became flesh. That which is physical is fallen, but it's not evil of itself. It's just under the, the Greeks believed it was the domain of a lesser god. <laughs> Again, a perversion of the truth. Because the creation was fallen, there was nothing wrong with it of itself, but once man fell, it came under the domain of Satan. The Greeks misunderstood it. They just saw what was physical was inherently bad, these, and, and what was spiritual or ethereal was good. This got into the thing, this is the background of, of Acts 17 with the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers that Paul was debating. But I just mentioned that in passing. So the idea of baptism in the biblical concept, takes that which is already a reality and makes it a functional reality, <laughs> okay? Now, not to be gross, but suppose Jack and Jill went on their honeymoon, okay? Oh, they eloped up to Gretna Green or whatever they did, and they went on their honeymoon, you know, to Bermuda or something, 
And, and they said, gee, that was wonderful. We'll have to sleep together again sometime and have a second experience. So 25 years later, they went on a second honeymoon. To go. It's not like that, is it? Look with me, please, to the book of Acts. Chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, in verse 1, they were all together in one place, Hag Shavuot, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. Much can be said about this. And it filled the whole houses where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving utterance. Okay. They're filled with the Spirit. Now, however, look with me to the book of Acts, chapter 4. Verse 8, same term, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. Now let's look at verse 31 of Acts chapter 4. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Who were they? The same ones that had happened on the day of Pentecost. The same thing happened again. Think about consummating a marriage. Okay, there's something unique or special about the first time by mere virtue of the fact it's the first time that you consummated the marriage. There's something special about the first time because it's the first time. But it's ongoing, isn't it? It's not a once or, or a twice. <laughs> it happens multiple times. Being filled with the Spirit is the same thing. It's, uh, okay, there's something unique about the first time. Something unique about it. Because it's the first time it happened to you. But it's not a first time and a second. <laughs> now there is a relationship between gifts of the Spirit and the gift of the Spirit. These should not be confused. Charism. Okay. This means grace. Gift of the Spirit is not to be confused with gifts. The gift, Dorea, think of that as a present, like a birthday present or something like that. The gifts <coughs> are never to an individual. They are to the church through an individual. The gifts are never to an individual. The charismata, the charisms, are to the church through an individual. It means grace. I have the gift of tongues. I have the gift of prophecy. No, you don't. Assuming the gift is real, the body has those gifts. You have the grace to be the vehicle through which it operates. But if you're saved, you do have the dorea, the gift of the Spirit. The two must not be confused. 
People confuse the two, and so they think if there's no tongues or charismatic manifestation, you don't have the gift. They're confusing two related but different things. They're confusing two related but different things. Everybody understand? I don't have the gift of teaching. The body of Christ has the gift of teaching. By the grace of God, it might operate through guys like me, but that's all. It's only his grace. I don't have that. But I have the dore, I have the gift of the Holy Spirit. So do you, if you're saved. Everybody understand. Get the basics right. When you understand the fundamentals, it eliminates so much of the confusion and misunderstanding. Okay. One baptism, many fillings. <laughs> One, okay, okay. One consummation, much romance afterwards. Now, let's continue looking at this. One of the problems is people misunderstand variations. We have variations in terms, variations in sequence, In terms, in sequence, and in experience, there are variations in terms, sequence, and experience. It's just like salvation, or it's analogous to salvation. One person was witnessed to by a friend in college. Another person went to a Billy Graham crusade or something. Another person heard the gospel on the radio. Another person received the track down the high street. You know, they'll all tell you how, how they got saved, but the same thing happened to all of them, but it didn't happen the same way. Suppose somebody said, well, if you were listening to the radio and, and the Holy Spirit convicted you of your sin and you knelt down and you prayed and repented and asked Jesus to save you and to make you born again, that's not valid because you didn't stand up and come forth at a meeting. <laughs> or put your hand up with every eye closed and every head, which is not even scriptural. You can't say that. Well, I guess maybe some people do, but you shouldn't say that. Spirit baptism is the same. It happens to different people differently in the book of Acts and today. But let's begin with terms. We have several terms for the same thing. And each term highlights a different aspect of the same thing. Let's just begin with the terms. The promise of the Holy Spirit, okay? Acts 2, 33. You can also look at Ephesians 1, 13, the promise. We'll look at each of these. The second, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38. Okay. Being filled with a filling, infilling, call it what you want. 
of the Holy Spirit. Okay. This is interesting. Luke 1, 15 and 41. Acts 2, 4. Then, in addition to the promise, the gift, and the filling, we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, 5. Acts 11, 16. So you've got the promise, the gift, the filling, and the baptism. And sometimes it's just called the receiving. Like the believers in Samaria, they only had the baptism of John, remember? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? When somebody takes their turn and makes a template out of it and insists everybody uses their turn, are you spirit-filled? Have you been baptized in the spirit? Have you received the gift of the spirit? This is going to lead to confusion. Each of these terms are not exactly synonymous but they all speak of the same thing, highlighting a different aspect of the same thing. For instance, let's look at the book of Acts, chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, verse 33, something very familiar to us. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Well, there is some aspect of the promise of the Holy Spirit describing spirit baptism that makes it unique in what it's emphasizing. It's highlighting some aspect. What is that aspect? What we read what that aspect is, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. That promise of the Spirit has the aspect of sealing. One of the things the baptism of the Spirit does is seal. Seal. Just think of, again, closing the lid of a casket and burying it. It's sealed unto the resurrection. Think of consummating a marriage. That's it. The relationship is now sealed anatomically. It's sealed. Okay. The promise highlights the aspect of sealing. That is one of the things spirit baptism does is seal people. Well, we talked about the gift. Let's look at Acts 2.38, please. Peter said, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, 
and you will receive the gift of the Spirit. That is the salvation aspect. When he breathed on them, he said, receive the, Spirit, the gift of the Spirit. When you're born again, you get the gift of the Spirit. What happened on Pentecost was, what had objectively transpired in John 20, when Jesus rose from the, died for their sin and rose from the dead and breathed on them? The, the breath, pneuma. Okay. Became a subjective experience something outwardly visible. Now, we next have the filling. It's important to understand the filling in a couple of ways. Let's look at Acts chapter 11, verse 16. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he used to say, how Jesus used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's spirit baptism, okay. We see that in Acts eleven sixteen. Acts 1, 5. John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Spirit not many days from now. John the Baptist said, he who is coming will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What does spirit baptism do? What aspect of the Holy Spirit does the baptism convey? Power and holiness. Power and holiness. As far as the holiness, in Hebrew, the Holy Spirit is known as Haruaka Kodesh, literally the spirit of holiness. The church in the New Testament that had to be reminded about the holiness of the Holy Spirit it was not the confused Thessalonians or the legalistic Galatians. Those churches had their problems, for sure. But the church that had to re be reminded about holiness, moral living, escaping from carnality, was the hyper-charismatic Corinthians. Not infrequently, you will find far more, sometimes far more, carnality among my fellow Pentecostals and Charismatics than you will among fundamentalists. Now, the fundamentalists have their own problems. They're suppressing the Holy Spirit. They, they, they've got their own problems. I'm not saying they don't. But, you know, this, this happy, clappy stuff, and it's all experiential, and, and it, 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 it's, it's emotionally charged religiosity that they think is spiritual. That predisposes people to moral seduction it predisposes people to moral seduction. If somebody is not empowered to live a moral life, they are not spirit-filled. You see these uh, preachers who are divorced and remarried with no biblical grounds and they're still in ministry. The power of the Holy Spirit is not in their ministry. Now they can try to augment <laughs> that deficit with human personality, with human charisma. But what you wind up with is hype, not anointing. <laughs> you understand? If there is a lack of moral living, you are not looking at a spirit-filled life. The other is power. Remember before the day of Pentecost, Although the apostles knew the gospel, although they had been born again, they did not have power, boldness. Look with me, please, to what Paul tells Timothy in the pastoral epistle, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. For this reason I remind you to kindle afresh 
the gift of God. which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Where there is a spirit-filled life, there is power. You can tell. You can tell there are preachers and evangelists who are not baptized in the spirit. What they're saying may be doctrinally true, <laughs> but there's no convicting power in it. It doesn't exist. I've known guys who are monotone, naturally monotone. Now, I don't have a problem with monotones, but a lot of people find them boring speakers. And, but I know monotones who were spirit baptized and they could hold people because of the power of the spirit, <laughs> despite their being monotone. It is an empowering that goes beyond our human capacity. As a young believer, I got saved through a cult. That was a major part of my problem. It's a complicated story. But for the first years of my Christian life, until I met Jews for Jesus, I was always messed up. I was always backsliding. I was always falling back into to sin and things like this. When I was spirit baptized, it changed. I had the power to overcome and to live the life that I knew I should have been living. Yeah, I was grieving the Holy Spirit the way I was living. But the power. Well, the power, if it's not the power to live morally, it's not the power to stop sleeping around. <laughs> stop taking, stop smoking marijuana and whatever. If, then it's no power. There's no power. It was the Holy Spirit who gave me that power. I didn't have that power. I didn't even have the desire not to do those things. Timidity. You can get somebody who can be very reserved, soft-mannered person, but you put, you put them on a platform to preach the gospel. Like people like Martin Lloyd-Jones. I mean, he was a very mild-mannered man. But when he stood in the pulpit, the power of the Spirit was on him. He was a fireball. That's spirit baptism. It's an empowering. You can tell this is the power of God's Holy Spirit. Okay. So the baptism highlights the wind, the power, the power of the Spirit, and the fire, moral living. The third thing Paul says, and love. <laughs> and love. The love of the Lord, agape. Okay. But let's look at the filling now. What aspect does that highlight? Acts chapter 2, verse 4, please. And they were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. Okay. Being filled. Now, what does this idea of filling mean? What aspect of the Holy Spirit is conveyed by calling it filling? Remember, they're all the same thing, but each of these terms highlights a different aspect. Look with me, please, to Acts chapter 1. I'm sorry, Acts, uh, Luke chapter 1. Verse 15. Prophesying of John the Baptist, he will be great in the sight of the Lord, Drink no wine, in other words, will be a Nazarite, or liquor, and will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Okay? And then in verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now let's understand this. Pay attention. 
it uses, it, okay, it tells the story of John the Baptist and his conception and his relationship to Jesus, okay, and, and relates to many things with the last days, the spirit of Elijah, all these facets come into play. But notice it uses pregnancy. What happens in pregnancy? One person is inside of another. Okay? One person is inside of another. The Holy Spirit was in embryonic John. John was inside Mary. I have Jesus in me. How? You have his spirit in you. Think of being spirit-filled means somebody else is inside of you. Another person is inside of you. And that person is the Holy Spirit who conveys Christ to us. Just like in a pregnancy, there's another person inside of you. Wherever a pregnant mother goes, expectant mother goes, she knows she's taking the baby with her. There's two of us now. There's a baby, and, and the, the, the more plump she gets, the more she thinks about it. The kid begins kicking around. She becomes very cognizant of the fact that there's another life inside of her. Well, being a Christian is the same thing. The longer you walk with the Lord, the more cognizant we should become that there's another person inside of us. Okay, Another person inside of us. So filling conveys the idea of another person being inside of us. Now, obviously, the satanic counterpart of this is, de is demon possession. Demon possession. Instead of the Holy Spirit, there's a demon in them. That's the satanic counterpart of it. So the aspect of baptism has to do with holiness and power. The aspect of promise has to do with sealing. Okay. But the aspect of filling has to do with being indwelt by another person. When a mother is expecting a baby, she's thinking what she eats, what she does, how is it going to affect the baby's health and all this kind of stuff, you know? Well, it's the same. When we're walking, when we're... How is the way we're living going to affect the person who's inside of us, this precious gift that God has given us? <laughs> okay, you have the precious gift of a baby, of life. That's a precious gift. But even more precious is the indwelling of God's own spirit. How is the way I live and what I do going to affect? You can't play rugby if you're pregnant. You know what I mean? We... You can't... <laughs> You can't go out with your unsafe friends and get loaded in a pub if you're, if you're a Christian. You know? <laughs> it's going to affect the person inside of you. You're always conscious this person is inside of you. That is the aspect highlighted by filling. All of these terms are about the same thing, but each term highlights a different aspect of it. Everybody understand? Now let's talk about the variations. We had variations in terminology. Let's talk about the variations of experience. On the day of Pentecost, we are told they were all filled with the Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, okay, as the Spirit was giving utterance. That's important. They did it as the Spirit gave utterance. Now, we are told the list of nations from which Jewish pilgrims came. This was a pilgrim feast, Hag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, when the Book of Ruth is read in the synagogue to this day. They were amazed in verse 7, astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each 
we each hear them in our own language to which we were born. The, your, in other words, your mother tongue. Parthians, who are Jews from Persia, and Medes, northern Iraq, Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia. You see Judea? Judea was Jerusalem and its environs. Okay. The mother tongue of Judea was Aramaic. The closest thing we have to what Jesus would have spoken is most, almost certainly something called the Peshitta text. Okay. Now, what was the mother tongue of the Galilean Jews? from Galilee, Aramaic. They spoke the same language. We know from the Mishnah that they spoke the same language, although with a different accent. They didn't like to let Galilean rabbis read the Torah scrolls in the synagogue in Judea because they couldn't pronounce the differences between the Hebrew letters Aleph and Ein suitably to read the Torah. That says that in the Mishnah. But we know that they both spoke Aramaic. It's like you're speaking with the Northern English accent or a Scouse accent. I'm speaking with the New York accent, but we're speaking the same language. Okay. You cannot prove from Acts chapter 2 that all of them spoke a foreign tongue. If they were all hearing of the tongue of their birth, their mother tongue, and there were Judeans there, and there would have been a lot of Judeans because they lived there. The others were pilgrims, come for the pilgrim feast. And obviously some of the 120 had to be speaking their normal, everyday Aramaic. <laughs> you cannot even prove from Acts chapter 2 exegetically that they all spoke another language. You can't prove it. Some of them, obviously, had to be speaking Aramaic, which is what they spoke every day anyway. People take that, <laughs> and they try to. What they do, are two things. They confuse the proscriptive with the descriptive. <laughs> the text is descriptive. It's describing what happened. It's not saying you should do it. <laughs> there are other places where you had spirit baptism where there's no mention of tongues. Let's look at a few of the other turning point instances. Look with me to Acts chapter 8. We'll begin in verse 14. When the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John. And they came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, this, then he gets into the sin of Simony, Simon Magnus. Now by way of background, two things have to be taken into account to understand this passage. Going back to the Assyrian captivity, the Samaritans were mongrel Jews, okay? They were... Assyrian colonists, 
who intermarried with the remaining Jews of the 10 northern tribes in 720 BC, and they intermarried, and they formed a schismatic sect of Judaism that had Mount Gerizim instead of Mount Zion. And they only accepted the books of the Torah. They didn't accept the prophets, and they changed certain portions of the Torah. They were seen as an apostate Judaism. So the apostles were afraid that you were going to have an apostate Christianity. You understand? <laughs> there was hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans, like in John 4. They were afraid that the Samaritans, well, since they're an apostate Judaism, now they're going to have an apostate Christianity. That's why they sent the apostles up there. Everybody understand? Then it goes into Simon Magnus. When you read Eusebius, Simon Magnus was a bigger deal than the book of Acts relates. He was, international, he was an international major, major figure who everybody in the Eastern Roman Empire knew about. For, for doing magic and things like this. He was a sorcerer, okay? He was a big, big deal. So a lot was happening in Acts 8. But there is no mention of glossolalia, of tongues. No mention of it, okay? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 10. The first Gentiles who become believers. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. And all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Now, now you do have tongues. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. There are varied variations of experience. Same as different people get saved different ways, spirit baptism happens differently. For me, when I was baptized in water in a brook in Pennsylvania in America, I came out of the water and the Holy Spirit hit me in a way that went beyond even when I was first saved. I mean, that was the first bolt of lightning. But when I, it was, that was me. It changed me. I was never the same after that. Okay. Different people will have different experiences. The problem begins when somebody takes their experience and makes a template out of it and it becomes a paradigm for everybody else. Or continuous with this, they take one instance from the book of Acts, something that is descriptive, and they turn it into something proscriptive. You know, this so people think there's something wrong with them if they're not speaking in tongues or in some places, they fake it. This becomes hypnotic induction. It's the same when Benny Hinn blows on people and they fall down. This is a combination of hypnotic induction and demonic deception. When slain in the spirit happened in the New Testament, they always fell forward. <laughs> The only place they fell backward was when they came to arrest Jesus and it was God's judgment. But that's another story. You understand, it becomes, it's something psychological, which they confuse as being spiritual. You see this phenomena of hypnotic induction combined with demonic deception and a lot of things, including much of what is called deliverance ministry. But let's continue. So you have variations in terminology, variations in experience. But then there are the third kinds of variations. Variations in 
sequence or chronology. You have people who were born again, like the apostles, and then on the day of Pentecost, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. You have Acts 10, Cornelius and his family, first Gentile saved. They are born again. Then they're baptized in the Spirit. Then they're baptized in water. Who can refuse water? To <laughs> again, the cloud comes before the water. <laughs> The day of Pentecost, you had the 120, but then you had the 3,000. They got the package deal. They were born again. They were baptized in the Spirit and baptized in water all at the same time. You can have people who get saved, baptized in water, then baptized in the Spirit. You can have people who get saved, baptized in the Spirit, then baptized in water. You can have people who have the package deal. The only thing you never have is somebody being baptized who's not saved. <laughs> the insanity. Who would take a little uh, a baby out of a crib and put it into a coffin and bury it if it wasn't dead? Infant baptism is not baptism. It is hideous. And again, it comes from the same nonsense of confusing the prescriptive with the descriptive. You and your household will be saved. That means we should baptize the baby. It's describing that situation. It doesn't say that children were never saved. It was a prophecy that his family would get saved. But you're reading something into it by turning something descriptive into prescriptive. Infant baptism is absolute nonsense. It's not baptism. If somebody was not baptized as a believer in water, they need to be. And if somebody's not baptized in the Holy Spirit as a believer, they need to be. But your experience or your sequence or whatever term you apply to it, We can give a lot of leeway. The Lord deals with us individually, where we are, where we're at. Same as people get saved in different ways, the spirit baptism will happen in different ways. The basics are very simple, aren't they? The basics are very simple. You know, my wife teaches math, and she has these algorithms and these quadratic equations, and you look at these things, and she says, what the heck? She can't balance a checkbook. <laughs> I'm, I'm married to the only mathematician in the world who can't balance a checkbook. But she can take these polynomial equations and these and reduce them to a simple mathematical statement that the average person can understand if properly explained. She takes all of this stuff and, and, and just here. Well, it just comes down to the basics. You know, engineering and technology are quite complicated, quite complex, but they're all based on laws of physics that you learn in A-levels. Most of science and technology comes from physics and things that you would learn in A-levels. Now what you do with it, that gets complicated. <laughs> but the basic physics is pretty simple. Well, theology is no different. Doctrine is no different. Y yes, it can become complicated. It is compl complex. But the basic mechanics of it are pretty simple. So much of this confusion, the majority of this confusion we have seen is wholly unnecessary. It comes from misunderstanding the text 
and misunderstanding each other. When you teach a little kid to play piano, they don't teach them to play Turkish Rondo in C major. They teach them to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. They teach them Do, a dear, a female dear. They teach them the scales, ascending and descending scales. You don't teach them chromaticism. You don't teach them dichronicism. You don't teach them harmonic theory. You teach them Do, a dear, a female. You get the basic things. Once you get the basic things, then you can add to it. Then you can look at these other aspects. Well, it's the same thing. Pianos, you know, it's just basically octaves and scales. That's all it is, octaves and scales on the piano. That's all. And all the other instruments follow a piano, basically. Stringed instruments and so on, but they all follow the piano. It's just octaves. It's, it's pretty basic. Once you get a handle on the basics, then you can innovate. Then you can boogie woogie or whatever you want to do, you know. But <laughs> you got to get the basic things. There's a lack of understanding of the basic teachings about baptism, about water baptism and spirit baptism. I guarantee you, I promise you, even if you only understand what we've gone through today, it will clear up the majority of confusion, division, and needless argument and misunderstanding. Get the basics. Once you get the basics, the rest becomes easy. That's the way it is. Now, I don't know what Jeff was Pastor Jeff was saying these weeks, I just know you've been addressing this subject and he asked me to address this subject. So I did because the, I always do what the pastor asks me to do when I'm invited to a church. If he leaves it to me, that's, then I have to go ask the Lord. But if the pastor tells me, then he's come to the Lord. So that's why I did this. I hope that it is profitable to you and to the fellowship. Thank you so much. God bless.